This one? Yeah. You have to do it with Cooler, yeah. It's the first one at night.
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise you, Lord, in the Lord's name be praised. We stand together and say Psalm 95, Psalm 95, on page 5 here. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and show ourselves glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all the gods. In his hand are all the corners of the earth and the strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his and he made it and his hands prepared the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and fall down and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is the Lord our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation, and said, It is a people that do err in their hearts, for they have not known my ways, unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and never shall be, world without end. Amen. Uh, we turn, please be seated, and we turn to the Psalms for the 18th morning. They're in order in the back of the prayer book. The 18th morning, which is page 462. We'll... Um, we turn the page to 464 and we read Psalm 91. Psalm 91 on page 462, we read together. Whoso dwelleth under the defence of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say unto the Lord, Thou art my hope and my stronghold, my God in him will I trust. For he shall deliver thee from the snare of the hunter and from the noisome pestilence. He shall defend thee under his wings, and thou shalt be safe under his feathers. His faithfulness and truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for any terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. For the pestilence that walketh in darkness nor for the sickness that destroyeth in the noonday. A thousand shall fall beside thee, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Yea, with thine eyes shalt thou behold, and see the reward of the ungodly. For thou, Lord, art my hope. Thou hast set thine house of defence very high, there shall no evil happen unto thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee in their hands, that thou hurt not thy foot against the stone. Thou shalt go upon the lion and adder. The young lion and the dragon shalt thou tread under thy feet because he hath set his love upon me. Therefore will I deliver him. I will set him up, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will hear him. Yea, I am with him in trouble. I will deliver him, and bring him to honour. With long life will I satisfy him, and show him my salvation. Amen. Turn to Joshua chapter 7, the book of Joshua 
chapter 7. The, the sixth book of the Bible after the five books of Moses, Joshua. Continues Moses' work in a sense. Joshua chapter 7. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Kami, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth Avon, on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai. And make not all the people to labour thither, for they are but few. So they went up thither of the people, about three thousand men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote of them about thirty and six men, for they chased them from before the gate, even unto Shebron, and smote them in the going down, wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the eventide, he and the elders of Israel, and put dust upon their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God we had been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan, O oh Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? The Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall environ us round and cut off our name from the earth. And what wilt thou do unto thy great name? And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up. Wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Israel hath sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant which I commanded them. For they even have even taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen and dissembled also, and have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither would I be with you any more except we destroy the accursed from among you. Up, sanctify the people and say, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For this saith the Lord God of Israel, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes. And it shall be that the tribe which the Lord taketh shall come according to the families thereof. And the family which the Lord shall take shall come by households. And the household which the Lord shall take shall come man by man. It shall be that he that is taken with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire. He and all that he hath, because he hath transgressed the covenant of the Lord, because he hath wrought folly in Israel. So Joshua rose up early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes, and the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought the family of Judah, and he took the family of the Zarites, and he brought the family of the Zarites man by man, and Zadi was taken. He brought his household man by man, and Achan 
the son of Kami, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him. And tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them and took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran unto the tent and behold, it was hid in his tent and the silver under it. And they took them out of the midst of the tent and brought them unto Joshua and unto all the children of Israel and laid them out before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan the son of Zerah and the silver and the garment and the weight of gold and his sons and his daughters, and his oxen, and his asses, and his sheep, and his tent, and all that he had, and they brought them unto the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones, and burned them with fire, after they had stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Wherefore the name of that place was called the Valley of Achor unto this day. Amen. Now we'll um, turn to the Apostles' Creed. In the prayer book, the Apostles' Creed, on page 11, we're... Stay together, and stand together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Please be seated. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, which art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us. Grant us thy salvation. O Lord, save the Queen, and mercifully hear us when we call upon thee. Endue thy ministers with righteousness, and make thy chosen people joyful. O Lord, save thy people, and bless thy inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord, because there is none other that fighteth for us, but only thou, O God. O God, may clean our hearts within us, and take note of thy Holy Spirit from us. Lord of all power and might, 
who art the author and giver of all good things. Graft in our hearts the love of thy name. Increase in us true religion. Nourish us with all goodness. And of thy great mercy, keep us in the same. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom, defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in thy defence, may not fear the power of any adversaries, through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with thy mighty power, grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings may be ordered by thy governance to do always that is righteous in thy sight. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, high and mighty, King of kings, Lord of lords, the only ruler of princes, who dost from thy throne behold all the dwellers upon earth. Most heartily we beseech thee with thy favour to behold our most gracious sovereign lady, Queen Elizabeth, and so replenish her with the grace of thy Holy Spirit, that she may always incline to thy will and walk in thy way. Endue her plenteously with heavenly gifts, grant her in health and wealth long to live. Strengthen her that she may vanquish and overcome all her enemies. And finally, after this life, she may attain everlasting joy and felicity. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, the fountain of all goodness, we humbly beseech thee to bless Charles, Prince of Wales, and all the royal family. Endue them with thy Holy Spirit. Enrich them with thy heavenly grace. Prosper them with all happiness. And bring them to thine everlasting kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, who alone workest great marvels, send down upon our bishops and curates and all congregations committed to their charge the healthful spirit of thy grace, and that they may truly please thee, pour upon them the continual dew of thy blessing. Grant this, O Lord, for the honour of our advocate and mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord to make uh, common supplications unto thee, and, and does promise that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou wilt grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. 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 We turn again to one of the Psalms for this morning to read the last of the three. Um, Psalm 92. We'll, we'll just read a part, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll chant a little bit at the end. Um, but we'll, we'll just read down to verse um, 9. Stand, stand together, we'll read to verse 9. 
It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord, and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most Highest, to tell of thy loving kindness early in the morning, and of thy truth in the night season, upon an instrument of ten strings, and upon the lute, upon a loud instrument, and upon the harp. For thou, Lord, hast made me glad through thy works, and I will rejoice in giving praise for the operations of thy hands. O Lord, how gracious are thy works! Thy thoughts are very deep. An unwise man doth not well consider this, and a fool doth not understand it. When the ungodly are green as the grass, and when all the workers of wickedness do flourish, then shall they be destroyed for ever. But thou, Lord, art the most highest for evermore. For lo, thine enemies, O Lord, lo, thine enemies shall perish, and all the workers of wickedness shall be destroyed. But mine horn shall be exalted like the horn of a unicorn, for I am anointed with fresh oil. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank thee, Lord, that thou hast anointed thy people with the anointing of the Messiah, our Christ, our Saviour, and has anointed us with thy Holy Spirit upon us, drawn us to thee, and so we are trusting in our Saviour, our wonderful Saviour. Thou hast shown us, Lord, great things through many times of life as we've waited upon the Lord, and thou hast heard our cries and delivered us and raised us up from low points. Lord, and with our nation now in, in uh, such tumultuous times, the whole world in tumult. Uh, we know that, Lord, many will continue in rebellion, but we pray that all thy people will turn to thee and be saved and know the Lord, and that we may be kept by the great power of God. We thank thee, Lord that thou dost love thy people. Thou hast given the Lord Jesus Christ to be the saviour of, of all thy people, Jew and Gentile, to come and be the people of God. And Lord, we do pray for other friends around the world that are worshipping thee today, and many of them in, in very difficult circumstances in South Africa and in, in Burma and no doubt in many countries. It's, it's most evil around, surrounding them. And uh, we pray, Lord, if there be believers in Afghanistan, what it must be like there for them. And in so many places, we can't name them, Lord, the, the number of countries where my people are being oppressed and treated like slaves. Oh, we pray that thou would, uh, would grant great measure of thy spirit upon them, and, a, and a, a great knowledge in gathering together that thou art with them as we trust thou art. We believe thou hast promised that thou will be with all thy people as we meet together in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, be merciful to us this day, Lord, protect us from the great powers of evil which would seek to uh, tempt us to sin and to destroy our, our witness and to bring our spirits low, Lord. We, Thank thee that thy spirit will come in when the enemy comes with that uh, great terror. The, the Lord raises up the spirit of God in his people and they are strengthened. Lord, help us to, to turn away from evil and to serve thee without fear, uh, only fearing thee and loving thee because of thy great grace to us. In Jesus' most precious name. Amen. 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 Let's be seated and let's turn to John chapter 13, which um, we've, where we were, but we are, we are really dealing with a, a big subject of Satan's work. So we're taking uh, various other places in scripture for the next two or three weeks, I think now. But um, I trust this will be beneficial to us. We've looked at then how Judas and how Peter were both tempted by Satan in particularly different ways and the ruin of 
Judas and the fall of Peter. Uh, and we've considered this subject then a little while, but I did mention a while ago a book. I'm not preaching from a book or about a book, but it's been a very helpful book over the years called Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. And it was an attempt by a Puritan, uh, Puritan today is someone who's so strict that you would rather avoid them unless they make your life a misery. But a Puritan really is, is a person that believes the Bible. And actually they're not as miserable as people claim that they are at all. They know God's grace, God's love, God's power. God's keeping them from Satan, no doubt. So Brooks in the middle of the 17th century, uh, he was, by the way, one of the easiest Puritans to read. He did lots of nice illustrations as he goes, little anecdotes that make you realize what he's saying. Um, and um, he realized that people weren't aware of what Satan was doing and why the church was in the state that it was. So it's a very, very useful subject and one which we could probably expand on. But we will take some of the things from his book. In, uh, but um, he gives several lists, long lists. There are 10 pages at the beginning of his points, of the different projects, it's ridiculous. But that's the way that they wrote things then. So when he gives one point, one of Satan's tricks, he gives five or six remedies to that particular one. And then he does another one of Satan's schemes and then several more remedies. But as you read through it, you can see where it joins together a bit and we don't need to keep putting so many remedies after every device that Satan has. They, they come together rather a lot. So I've rather simplified this. Um, complete, well, completely simple. I mean, it's simple enough to read, but it's just, you know, you don't want to have the fifth point on the twelfth point and all that sort of thing. But, but, um, um, so I've got seven things um, out of the 12 and um, three of the others just briefly, I think that was the amount, seven or, yeah. Um, it's something else to say to begin with. Um, so, then let's just we, we, we begin with the first point, and this is um, that Satan would. Well, the, the first list is that Satan draws people to sin. There's there's other ones. Satan causes people to be a, a, a feeling uh, very separate from God. That's a separate one, and then then there's some other points. But this this first list is the way that Satan draws people uh, to sin. And so the first one of these is, uh, it stands out actually, this one I think, um, presenting the bait but hiding the hook, he calls it. Presenting the bait but hiding the hook. So in Genesis chapter 3, when our first parents, Adam and Eve, were, were tempted, um, the devil promises life, but hides the fact of what will happen. Uh, it's all a deception, isn't it? To present things in one way. So, for example, today, the devil will tempt a person to, to do certain things, they, but they don't see the consequences of it. They, he, he presents the stealing and the killing and the lying, but he doesn't present them with the picture of the policeman and of the judge and of the prison cell or in the old days of the hangman's noose, someone stick, they don't consider these things. Satan draws them quickly to these things. But the devil tempted Judah to shame his sister, Tamar, but he presents her as beautiful, but he doesn't present the shame that Judah would feel afterwards. So this is Satan's trick. Present the bait, give them the bait. Ah, here's, here's something to do, but don't show the consequences of the sin. So it makes it easier for someone to go ahead and sin when they don't see what 
the hook that's hidden in the middle of it here. The Bible describes those that are tempted by uh, prostitutes and such things. They see something, but they don't see what they're going to do to themselves, the ruin that they're going to bring. I mean, we can see it. You look at people's lives, maybe things in your own life where you, you, you can look at and you see that you didn't realise what was going to happen, looking back. So the remedies for this, um, Proverbs, well, simple things. Enter not into the path of the wicked. Go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Pass not by it. Turn from it. That's uh, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 14, 15. Pass away. Keep away from the bait. Uh, don't play with the bait, as it were. And now there's other remedies that he gives, but we go on and consider some of the other schemes, the other devices that Satan uses. But it's a very obvious one, isn't it? You think, yeah, of the effect of sin, hidden. You just see the sin and he presents it to you. The, the, the foolish person goes for it without seeing the hook inside. The second trick is a strange one. Painting sin as a virtue. Hard to believe, isn't it? How could you present sin as a virtue? He gives a few examples. Uh, pride. I was very proud. Well, they, they don't really they think that they're just doing well, doing the right thing. Um, we could be greedy and we call it good stewardship. You see, painting it, giving it a different picture. Being in bad company. Uh, well, so we, we, we're just trying to help people. Now, you, you may be, there, there may be, there may be these examples, but we've, it, it's, it, there's a subtlety of what Satan can do. Um, we may tolerate sin as if we're trying to win people, trying to be kind, you see. I'm not saying these things are easy at all, but the idea that it is actually sinful what you're doing, but being presented by the devil is good. Very tricky. Well, some remedies for this. Again, keep back from sin. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Romans chapter 12, verse 9. And again, as we saw about the, about the hook hidden, consider the bitterness that will follow. Um, I was just talking about... Um, people that follow other religions, you know, uh, but we're following the sweetness of Christ, aren't we? Christ died for sin. How could we entertain things what Christ has died for? Now, the third trick, the devil then suggests that a sin is a small sin. It's not a big thing. But the Bible warns us a little leaven, leaven is the whole lump. Our aim as Christians isn't to minimize sin, it's to, to destroy sin, to be free from sin. I'm not saying that we're, none of us are perfect, but the temptation that just something is a small sin that doesn't really affect us is, is a danger. We saw in that reading of Achan there, the cursed thing, one man picked up a Babylonish garment and some gold and silver at the, at the destruction of uh, Jericho and he kept it and that ruined that army when they went into battle, it ruined the nation, sin was upon them because of one man's evil, it's hard to believe, you'd say it's impossible, why would God have made them lose that battle just because one man was sinning, you think of that in the church, if, if one of us is sinful. I mean, it just seems extreme, doesn't it? But let's not be fooled that sin is, is unimportant or a small thing. But that's how the devil will present it. Just a little. Evil communications corrupt good manners, we're told. We should not, we should be wary, uh, to say the least, that we don't pick up the 
bad habits of those that, we, that, that we're with. It's very easy to do. You want to talk in the same language that people are talking to you. I was thinking about this at, at, at school, where you, uh, it's the same in the workplace. People use certain phrases that it's not proper speaking. What are they saying? And then because we want them to hear us, we speak back with the same language that they use. It starts off very small, but it gets worse and worse. And before we know where we are, we, we're speaking in a very rude manner. Very easy for evil communications, as it were, to corrupt good manners. We must be wary. But a little sin, the devil will say that it's not something to be worried about. Ecclesiastes says that the beginning of the words of his mouth, Ecclesiastes 10, verse 13, the beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness. So it just starts with a little foolish talking. And the end of his talk is mischievous madness. Start with a little sin of just a little foolish talk. It's been a great effort, <laughs> personally, coming from a background of foolish talk to, to try and put it away. It's a very it's a great challenge. It, it, it can lead on to more you know, terrible things. It says here, start with a few, a few foolish words and you end up in mischievous, mischievous madness. James 3 verse 4 says, Behold, all so the little ships which though they be so great, little, little ship, a big ship, great ship, driven by fierce winds, yet they're turned about with a very small helm. Even so the tongue, as a little member, and boasted great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. A little fire from the tongue. I think wars have been started, haven't they, over one or two words that people have said. <clears throat> so, don't let the devil persuade you, trick you to be careless in speech. It's a very great challenge to us. We need the Lord's help. Uh, the remedies, one, another remedy in these matters in God, in the devil's tempting us, is remember the godly. Remember the godly that have gone before us. There's some lovely examples of this. Who have resisted evil at all costs. The Reformation martyrs, they would rather have died than gone to the mass, the Roman mass, because the offering of Christ is a blasphemous sacrifice. So they would not attend. And they were put to death for that, for that, for just being in a false church. And how easily we can be, uh, as it were, politely going to, um, to some uh, false religion of some sort. Now to talk to people, you know, there, there is a careful use of that for, for, for particularly ministers to, to try and reach people, but the very great wisdom is required but not to be. But these people died for not going along with transubstantiation, the turning of the bread into wine because it was blasphemous. They were to, that's what they would do to resist sin. Daniel would have rather have been in the lion's den and died, and his friends in the furnace and died than to deny God and to bow down to an idol. How many today will sit still and not speak or resist in any way? Tom Brooks mentions a great man in the time of Constantine who was tortured mercilessly. Even they had the children torturing him as well. I won't describe it. I, forgotten it thankfully but um, he would not give a small coin which wouldn't have cost him wouldn't have cost him anything in real terms a small coin to build an idol's temple and now we get them all 
in their ceremonies every time a, a mosque is open and the, all the you get the you get the mayors and the councillors and the MPs all they congratulating them and how happy they are for them. The old people were prepared to be mocked and to die, not to encourage idolatry. Wouldn't give them a penny. This particular man, his name, Marcus Arethusius. But we've never heard his name, have we? But we should be thankful that there were people like Marcus Arethusius who loved the Lord so much that they would not give a penny to idolatry. That was how they were prepared to resist sin, to be tortured, mocked, and torn to pieces. Remember Joseph, who, who turned away from Potiphar's wife when she tempted him. Job made a covenant with his eyes that he would not look at young women. Yet the world says, it's fine. Look at whatever you like, as long as it, it doesn't lead to, to, to assault, use a polite word, then it doesn't matter what you do with your eyes. The Bible says no. Job made a covenant with his eyes not to look upon the maid. And in this world, the Christian avoiding the devil's tricks into small sins, it will lead us to being mocked, if not tortured. If they were tortured, if the godly were tortured, can't we cope with a little mocking, with a little bit of having a funny reputation? Why we don't join in their games? Wherein they think it's strange, Peter says. First Peter chapter four, verse four. They think it's strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. That's good, isn't it? Let the world think it's strange that we don't um, run uh, run with them in their excess of riot. Let them speak evil of us because we don't join in their evil. Let's remember the godly, that were prepared to lose their lives for doing the right thing. Another remedy, your soul will not be able to stand sin. It may sound like a strange one, and there's a very lovely example about this. Your soul will not be able to stand sin. It won't go with you. If you make those choices that are sinful rather than righteous, and we won't try and describe all that, we've talked about a lot of this before. But William Perkins tells of, this is an example, he tells of a poor man. William Perkins was a great teacher of preachers in the 16th and 17th, early, early 16th century. <coughs> he tells of a poor man who stole a sheep to feed his family. It's poor. If you can't eat, you have to steal. There's no choice, or you're going to die. He stole the sheep to feed his family. The poor man was about to give thanks to God. He was trying to give thanks to God. He, he still was a, see, he was a godly poor man in a way, but he felt driven to steal the sheep. And as he was praying to give thanks to God for the, for the lamb that they were eating, he couldn't do it. See, his conscience got him. And he, he went to the owner of the sheep and he, he told him, look, I've, I've stolen your sheep. I'm, I'm trying to eat it with my family. I'll, I'll pay you back. Sin cannot stand with the soul of the righteous. We cannot. So better avoid it. Better avoid it. People, Christians have, 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 have suffered just for having evil thoughts, holding on to evil thoughts, how it can torment a Christian, flee from sin, turn to Christ, resist the devil, oh, that we might be sensitive to sin, that we would avoid it. Now, you might think that sounds ridiculously idealistic, 
but another remedy. These, this is why Brooks goes into this such, such, such length. And a, 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 another remedy, the great pain and trouble of resisting sin is much less evil. So the, the things you feel by resisting sin, by doing the right thing, you think, oh, this is hard. But that trouble, that evil, that evil, as it were, that you feel is much less than the least sin. The wages of sin is death. Whatever you suffer resisting sin, as, uh, um, as um, the Epistle to the Hebrews says, you haven't resisted sin unto blood yet. The evil of sin is so bad that the smallest sin we should, we should desire to be fleeing from it. And a fourth trick of Satan, to tell you that repentance is easy. If you sin, you can be sorry, can't you? You can go in the Roman Catholic Church, just go to the Mass, see the priest. He says some things, you told you to do some prayers and you're forgiven. No, repentance is not easy. If you go into sin, repentance is particularly hard. As a believer, you're really asking for trouble. Well, Saul, Esau, after he sold his birthright, he would have inherited the blessing and he was rejected, but he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Esau, he sought it with tears, he sought repentance with tears, but he couldn't find it. How oh, we must be careful not to go into sin thinking that repentance will be easy. I tell you this because I don't think this is uncommon. If you sin, another remedy um, to think that just saying, Lord, have a mercy on me, and it's forgiven. Repentance must be very sincere, it's very full. Uh, the uh, chastising of God is a deep thing which we would seek to, to avoid by not sinning. True repentance is like the prodigal son. He's really come to that point of seeing his loathing, not only of the sin, but of himself, his filthy condition. It's not easy. This is a rare, repentance is a rare thing. And though we repent when we come to Christ, how terrible to continue in such a way. Though, uh, um, so, <clears throat> and another remedy for this view of easy repentance is that um, though the people of God will not be disinherited, this is, we come to this really here, they can suffer great loss. Ask yourself, is it worth it? But it's not, is it? Any loss, anything least diminishing, our, our fellowship with God, his blessings, our usefulness, it's not worth it for the smallest sin. We must really think, well, let's really want to be really getting away from any of the devil's tricks that would trick me on this. Yes, King David recovered, Hezekiah recovered, Peter recovered. But what might have been, well, we know in God's providence, these were all part of God's works, but the promise of Joel, you see, is a great one. Joel 2, verse 25, and I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten. Now that's a very precious promise, isn't it? And we can look back over our past lives and say, the Lord has been so merciful to me. He's he really has restored the years that the locusts have eaten. Wasted youth, all sorts of things. And the Lord has given me the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. How wonderful it is. But that the Lord will restore the years that the locusts have eaten. If we go into further sin, that's not the way, that's not the way this verse is intended. Not at all. There will be loss if we continue in sin, saying that grace may abound. We might compare, for example, the usefulness of Paul, the Apostle Paul. There's nobody like that really, is there? That's 
as, as, as full in every respect. He, he didn't only work hard, the Apostle Paul, he was clearly a holy man and a prayerful man. It's absolutely wonderful what he did. The amount of help he gave to people. But compare that perhaps with Peter or Barnabas or Mark who, who, who fell. Now they were still used again, but surely not in the way that Paul was. So let us not think to ourselves, well, repentance is easy. Let's really have a great as it were, effort, as it were, to resist the devil and remember some of these things. Let us learn, good remedy, learn by the mistakes of others. People love that phrase, isn't it? we learn by our mistakes. So just go and make lots of mistakes and then go and learn from them. Well, we will inevitably do that. But if we can learn from the mistakes in the past, the mistakes of history, those that have gone before, that's what the Bible is about, isn't it? That we learn, there are examples, they're given to us, for examples that we might not go lusty, that we might see the danger of sin, we might see that sense of loss, learn by the examples of the godly, the wonders that they've done, How, and be encouraged to stand up against Satan's temptations against us. And then another remedy, well, I mean, we've said this already, I think I'm not going to mention it at length. To sin against the light is much more serious if we know the truth and sin. You see some poor person going around sinning and uh, in living godlessly. They don't know the Lord. But for those that have heard the gospel, those that know Christ, this is most serious. A sixth trick of Satan, like repentance is easy, sin can be forgiven. Well, you can do this and you can just ask God to forgive you the next minute. That's a trick of Satan. That's a very dangerous way of going about things. You're already believing Satan. You're not trusting God. But if you go doing the right thing, the Lord be with you. What should we say then, Paul wrote in Romans 6? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Should we say, well, it doesn't matter. The more evil we do, the more grace, the more God can forgive us. Isn't that rather a good thing? Um, uh, <laughs> right. Um, no, that's not how it works at all. Christ, I always said, Christ died for sin. It, so sin can be forgiven. Yes, indeed. Thank, thank God that our sins are all forgiven. All past, present, and future sins. Christ died for every one of them. But those that love Christ, we we if we. If we, if we sin, as we do, we do sin in various respects, not loving the Lord fully, being somewhat desiring other things, whether whatever we do or don't do, whatever we think and say, and where our hearts are at certain times. But what loss there is, what suffering there is with the sin of the Christian. We, we've, as it were, sinned against the blood of Christ, against our Saviour who loves us. So being unfaithful. Capernaum, which are exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down low, down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee, the people, Christ's people, that he was with and saw them and was blessing them, if those works had been done in Sodom, the most evil place, it would have remained until this day. The, the judgment upon those that have the blessing of Christ is so much more than those who sin, as it were, in more ignorance. Uh, let's be aware of those small sins and the consequences that might be upon us. Um, so let us not think it's 
just a little lie, sin be forgiven. Oh, I keep the commandments, but not exactly. A little lie, avoiding a bit of tax, cheating on something. Uh, because it's easier, I, I made a promise, but actually I'd rather not keep it because it's inconvenient. Uh, these things all start eating away at us and don't assume that it's easy to be forgiven. As a Christian, of course, we, tell, we, can't, we can't be Christ to be forgiven. It's this willingly being taken and foolishly when we should be praying for God as it was um, in the prayer book. It's, it's, it must be a rare thing. This. I've emphasized this before at the beginning of the of the uh, prayers that we have, um, where it says, page, um, it says, uh, defend us in the same of the mighty power, grant that this day we fall into no sin. What a prayer! Grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger. And the prayer, I've emphasized this many times, defend us. Asking God for this, to defend us in all assaults of our enemies, that we may not sin, we may not be led astray in these various ways. Let us not take these matters lightly. If we indulge in some sinful, it starts with thoughts coming to us that we take hold of and continue. Seventh trick of Satan, and this is the last one I've got down here, so we're, we're doing good times. I'm not going to just mention the three in passing at the end. Is to, is to, for us to think that sin would be uh, prosperous. Sounds un, un, unbelievable, doesn't it? While the godly are in misery. And the example is of Jeremiah in chapter 44 and verse 16, where they say, the people say, well, we did well. When we were giving offerings to the Queen of Heaven, we did well. But it's sin. There may have been a coincidence of the example earlier on of somebody believing that in doing the things that Buddha said, they did well. Well, some things may do well. That the wicked can prosper. Sin can prosper. But it doesn't justify it. They can have an appearance of godliness. Uh, Thomas Brooks was referring, I think, to back in the times of the Roman Church, before the gospel came, when they had their little idols and every, the whole family went into the chapel. It was all very quaint. They didn't know what they were doing. They were all quite happy. But when the gospel came, there was a challenge. The devil didn't like it. And so... They were tempted. Just go along with the old ways. Go along with the Roman religion and it would be quiet, it would be easy. You'd be better off. What a temptation it is to draw us to think that it's doing okay. The sinful way, we, we, I think in the book of Revelation, they were resisting going along with these trade guilds where they'd make pagan sacrifice. It would go well with the business. It's just a small compromise. Com is a big word today, compromise, isn't it? In the Christian church. If we just bend on this a bit, bend on that a bit. Don't worry about if the people are not married. This is the sort of thing, and it leads from one thing to the next. Remember then, against this, the idolaters will be ruined. The righteous will be vindicated. We saw this last time, I think, in Psalm 73, when the psalmist was envious of the wicked. He saw their success, how nicely it was going. We just bend a few rules here and there, a little trick here and there, and we do very well, thank you. But then he went into the sanctuary of God he saw their end, he saw their ruin. We should fear sin much more than we do. There are too few examples today of people that flee from sin in the way that we should. Because we should be resisting the devil, you see. 
this sin. It's the devil's attempt to spoil his church. Other remedy, the, the last remedy I've got on this one is um, the sufferings of the righteous work for good. The sufferings of the righteous work for good. It isn't only that the suffering doesn't contain evil, the evil, the, the trouble of the suffering is bad. It's actually working for good. When we do the right thing and it has and it's hard for us because we won't trick our way through things, if we do things honestly, we appear to be doing badly. But God is working for good. We can't see the This is about faith. This is about trusting in Jesus Christ, isn't it? When he deals with us in a harsh way, perhaps, he's working good things. You can really say, I've said it before, that if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we believe not only for him to save us from hell, we believe that the things he teaches us for the way to live are right and that he will be faithful if we follow him day by day. And Satan will draw us away with one trick after another to trick us into this not being so. Another great example of this, of the use of such things is a man called Gregory Nazianzen, you may have heard of him, Nazianzen, occasionally he's quoted. He was in the fourth century, he, he was the Archbishop of Constantinople. Sounds very strange, fourth century though, very early on in the church. And when he did well, when he was prospering, he did a very wise thing to avoid the devil catching him with pride. When he was doing really well, he didn't jump up in the air and sing and clap his hands, which he could have done as well, I suppose. And pray. I'm sure he praised God when he was doing well and thanked God for it. But the other thing he did when, he was, when things were going really well for him, he read the lamentations of Jeremiah, the weeping. He, he did this to humble himself, to remember that it was God's mercies why he was doing well, why he succeeded. He wasn't taken up with pride. He read the Lamentations of Jeremiah and felt sorrows for his own sin. He kept himself. Isn't this one of the things missing in the church today? Confession of sin. Uh, we, we mentioned we begin our service with a general confession. It, it, um, very important. The devil says, no, just come in. Just come in and sing and praise God. And yet you, we haven't come humbly before God. There's probably lots more of these schemes that have been used in the present day that we should be more aware of. But Nazianz had humbled himself before God. Remember what David said. Psalm 119, verse 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now... Have I kept thy word? It wasn't a good thing that David went astray, but he was afflicted and doing good and he repented and now he kept God's word. There's three more things which I've just written a sentence on, the devices of Satan that Brooks mentions. Um, only briefly to mention them because we've mentioned Remedies, I think, that deal with these things already. Well, I think we've mentioned this partly already. The devil will tempt you to think of yourself as being better than others. The devil will tempt you to think of yourself as being better than others. And to become proud. I'm rather a good Christian. Our church is like this. It's not like that. It's very easy for the devil to tempt us. And the, the great remedy for for this is the gospel. The gospel that we are sinners for whom Christ died. We're nothing more than sinners saved by grace. We're nothing more day by day 
and people in whom the Spirit of God is dwelling. There's no good thing in us. Any good thing has come from God, down from heaven. We can be thankful for the Lord's work in us, but we must be very, very careful it doesn't turn into pride and thinking ourselves as being better. God may have used us as an example of a very bad person who God can at least do something with. Let's see it like that. That's a temptation of Satan. As soon as you think to yourself above others, you've got a wrong and a terrible pride. Uh, then the other one of the three, the last one's... Um, falling for bad theology, especially if the person's intellectual. They can be taken up with thoughts, scriptural thoughts even, and they're not even scriptural thoughts, but analysing the Bible, going on and on and on. Or they can be impressed by the way a person, the way a man speaks. There are preachers who've got golden tongues, and you listen to them, it sounds absolutely perfect. But there's false teaching in there. And you don't catch that bit because you hear just the wonderful tone and all this. Very dangerous temptation of Satan to fall for bad theology, bad teaching. Um, and then another temptation, well, I think we probably pointed it, bad company, to fall into bad company for the various reasons I think we've given and we've given some of the remedies for that already. So there's a whole raft of things. The devil's favourite scheme is to say that it doesn't exist, isn't it? Now there's, there's a bit more of this to go, but this, these things I hope will make us wary, wary of ourselves and of difficult times, I think, to understand our temptations come from within ourselves very much. But think how the devil will be working on you and drawing. He's got millions of, of his own demons and angels working. I don't know how he works with so many people. I guess it's by having so many different demons, each trying to get you. And as they say, we've got the Holy Spirit. But it's clear from the Scriptures that the devil is always out to destroy the people of God. And if he can't get us to kill ourselves, he'll get us to, to sin. He'll tempt us and he'll trick us in these various ways that sin isn't quite what you think it is. And he'll lead us by these deceptions where we've got many defences, many remedies here against him. And I hope we can remember some of them and bring them to mind at, at at all times. Now, last conclusion, put on the whole armour of God. Ephesians chapter 6, and without going into this at length, I think we've spoken on it already. Putting on the armour of God is to put on Christ. If the Lord Jesus was here, he would resist every attempt of Satan, wouldn't he, perfectly. But we put on Christ to be holy, full of faith, trusting him, obeying God. But he is our saviour. He is our defence. If we love him with all our heart, I'm sure he will be helping us in this battle to be watching and praying. We do have a great battle on. I hope I haven't blinded you with too many different thoughts on it this morning. The devil will try in any way he can. It's not easy to even prepare such things. But I trust that in the days ahead, we will be vigilant. We will know that Satan's devices are trying to get us. But that we are indeed, while we are safe in the Lord Jesus' hands, I maybe should encourage you with that, we're safe with our Lord Jesus Christ. There is a great uh, reduction, as it were, in the power of the church when Satan gets an advantage. And if he gets an advantage on any of us, let's, well, we all pray for one another that the Spirit of God may be operating within us in a, in a, 
in a, in a powerful way that we know our Saviour Christ and that we're wise unto some of the devices that Satan will try and trick us with. Satan is much more powerful than we are, but our Saviour Christ is much more powerful than Satan. We do have a challenge. Let's not think that these things are easy. Let's not think that maybe perhaps we do slip from time to time. Let's be quick to repent. And let's be, be wary. But nevertheless, despite all this going on, our Lord Jesus has cast out Satan. He has destroyed him. And though Satan is active, we're not to be exaggerating his limitations upon us. We ourselves have responsibility to live. We're seeking to please the Lord. Like other points on this, I think, come up this evening from a different angle. But let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we understand from the Bible that the devil is going about as a roaring lion. He's seeking to destroy the church. And in our days, we feel that perhaps even to a large extent, he's been very successful. Oh, but Lord, we know that thou hast promised to bless thy people. And thou hast known the end from the beginning. But we're in the midst of it, O oh Lord. And we have often been caught out. We pray thou will give us great wisdom. I hope some of these um, attempts to explain some of Satan's plots and the various remedies we can use against them will, will help us. Lord. We pray that these things will help us. But we know that Satan can be very quick. And can, can catch us off guard. So we do ask the Lord to, to, to dwell in us. That thy Holy Spirit may dwell in us. That we may be diligent in the scriptures and in prayer, and that we may watch not only the things around us, but we may watch our own hearts and the risings in our hearts of false ideas and all these misconceptions that can come upon us. Lord, we pray that thou would teach us to correct things that we've actually got wrong and that we may be continuing wrong things that we may be believed for a, a long time. We may just believe that we just pray and Satan goes away or that we, we declare that he's removed from whole times. But Lord, we see that his devices are much more subtle than that here. And that we need to be continually vigilant, continually putting on the whole armour of God. We pray, Lord, that thou would draw us very near to our Lord Jesus, that we may not be tricked, that we may not trust in ourselves, in any of our own wisdom, but we may trust in thee alone, and so that thou will bless thy people through all circumstances and fiery trials, and cause us to love the Lord with all our heart and soul and mind and strength and our neighbours as ourselves, especially they of the household of faith. Oh, Lord, be merciful. We pray, Lord, that thou would help us as a church to even be able to snatch others out who are fully, really fully under Satan's grasp. They cannot come to God. They've been blinded by the prince of this world. And yet Christ has power and authority over him. Oh Lord, give us wisdom from above and especially thy Holy Spirit 
that we may walk as the true saints of God, as holy people that belong to thee, give thee all the honour and praise and glory. In the Lord Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Just conclude with a few words of Psalm 92 that we were uh, reading earlier on. Psalm 92 in the in the prayer book, back to the prayer book. Psalm 92 and From verse 11 to 14. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree and shall spread abroad like a cedar in the barnness. Such as are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of the house of our God. They all shall, shall bring forth more fruit in their age and they shall be fat and well liking that they may show how true the Lord my strength is and there is no unrighteousness in him. So Psalm 92 from verse 11 to 14 in the prayer book, you're right. So we'll, we'll, we'll sing to a gentle chant this. Oh. Uh, I can I'll find it for you here, shall I find it for you? Quickly. Um, it's on page 466. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree and shall spread abroad like a cedar in the goddess, such as are planted in the house of the Lord, shall flourish in the courts of the house of shall bring forth more fruit in their age and shall be fat and well liking that they may show how the true Lord my strength is and that there is no unrighteousness in Blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be with you now and forever. Amen. 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 I hope everybody's got sunblock. <laughs>